Hi everyone, this time we are going to be talking about religion. Uh, to talk about religion in sociological terms, we will be first defining religion, then we will look at how sociologists specifically study religion, then we will look at a very brief catalog of world religions, and then we will discuss religion as it exists in the United States. So, in order to talk about religion, you have to define it. Uh, one substantive definition of religion we can use is that religion has unique content or substance relating to the sacred that separates it from other form of knowledge and belief. So, in other words, religion is um, has unique ideas to it that make it different than other things, right? And that's so incredibly vague. But that definition works because religion is very hard to define. Uh, let's look at another definition. Religion is a system of common beliefs and rituals that believers believe, right? Uh, centered on sacred things that unites believers and promotes a sense of meaning and purpose. So religion creates and reinforces social cohesion or feelings of belongingness. Religion provides a sense of meaning and purpose to the events of life, right? Whether it is a community uh, event or catastrophe or a personal event or catastrophe, religion brings meaning to tough moments or, or beautiful moments, right? So uh, death, uh, marriage, birth of a child, right? Religion is a form of culture. Uh, or it's a component of culture. And religion brings ritualization and routinization of beliefs. So religion allows us to collect the things that we believe about um, the metaphysical, if you will. It's a little easier to define religious beliefs. Religious beliefs are statements to which members of a particular religion adhere. So, uh, if you would ask 10 Christians what they believe, you would expect um, 10 relatively, not identical, but relatively similar answers. Fundamentalists, then, are a specific type of religious belief, a fun fundamentalism is rigid adherence to the core religious doctrines of the given religion. And fundamentalism is found worldwide among most major uh, religious groups. So, in the United States, uh, Christian fundamentalists believe very specific things about uh, their religion and the Bible. And Christian fundamentalists take, tend to take the Bible literally, right? Uh, but there are fundamentalists in all world religions. Um, and that doesn't mean they're inherently uh, uh, good or inherently bad people. It's just making a statement that they believe uh, in a very rigid, uh, literal interpretation of their religious doctrines. Religious experience are feelings of perception of being in direct contact with ultimate reality, or being overcome with religious emotion. Uh, being that uh, the United States reports to be 75% uh, Christian, I'm assuming uh, m the majority of people uh, seeing this uh, may benefit a little bit from Christian examples, but I give other examples as well. In terms of uh, religious experience, Christians call this uh, being in contact with God, feeling God's love, right? Religious experience. Uh, Buddhist may call this a glimpse of nirvana. A Hindu may call this um, moksha, uh, which is a different idea. Uh, but all religions have this idea of, re well, most religions have this idea of religious experience. Religious rituals. Religious rituals are practices required or expected of members of a given faith. So if you are a member of a given religion, you are expected to do these things. Common examples include the communion ritual that almost every uh, Christian community does, eating 
symbolically of the body and blood of Christ via uh, bread and some kind of wine or juice, right? That is a ritual. Uh, the bar or bat mitzvah rituals in Judaism, uh, Jewish uh, boys and girls uh, pass into their religious adulthood uh, with the bar mitzvah ritual. It's boys with bat mitzvah rituals in Reform Judaism. It's girls, and that is a ritual that everyone in that community takes part in. And then the Hajj in Islam. The Hajj is a series of rituals. It is a pilgrimage uh, to the Holy Land uh, in which many rituals take place during that period of time. Uh, that is a complex uh, series of rituals. Now let's define a few more descriptive terms to talk about religion. Monotheism is a type of religion in which the believer believes in a single, all-knowing, all-powerful God. That is monotheism. Um, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, what we call our Abrahamic religions, those are all monotheistic faiths. Theism is belief in one or more supernatural deities. So, uh, monotheism believes in one deity, uh, theism believes in either one deity or multiple deities, so monotheism is a type of theism, but polytheism is also a type of theism. Polytheism is a, the belief in multiple deities. Non-theistic religions, then, are belief in existence of divine supernatural force rather than a god or gods. So a non-theistic religion does not believe in God or gods. Non-theism believes in powers or forces in the universe. Uh, example of this, uh, most interpretations of uh, Buddhism are non-theistic. Taoism uh, is non-theistic. Uh, Zen Buddhism specifically is uh, non-theistic. Uh, at times verging on atheistic, which is very interesting. Uh, atheism, then, is a belief in the non-existence of God, gods, or the divine. Atheists believe that, basic, and often this is associated with a school of philosophical thought known as humanism. Uh, humanism uh, really being all about everything that humans can do, right, without faith without religion, without a belief in the supernatural, really. That's what the philosophy of humanism is. Atheism is often tied in with humanism, not always, but atheism is about um, the philosophical exploring of what if there isn't anything, right? What if there isn't a God? What if there isn't afterlife? What if there isn't all of that? But what does that mean, and how can we still be good people? That's what most uh, atheists go, go about believing. Now that we've defined those couple basic terms, let's look at how sociologists study religion. Because um, one of the reasons why I really enjoy teaching sociology uh, specifically is because it allows us to address things like religion in a way that we couldn't really address otherwise. Uh, because it, is, it can be really hard to talk about religion. So functionalism, go back to our three core sociological perspectives, functionalism views religion as serving to strengthen community solidarity and give answers to difficult questions. So the functionalist observes religion and it sees that religion serves the purpose of benefiting the community, of helping us pull together and helping us determine what we need to do in the given it, when someone dies, when a child is born, when people get married. That's what we turn to religion for in many cases. When there is a great catastrophe, right, then people often turn to religion. Functionalists are also interested in the difference between what is called the sacred and the profane. And this is something actually that Durkheim was very interested in himself. Now, when functionalists talk about the sacred and the profane, they might be using those words a little bit differently. 
the sacred in their terms are the special things, the things in the religious belief that hold special importance to believers, such as communion bread. Pro the profane things then are normal, everyday stuff, non-special, right? So uh, you can imagine, and not necessarily bad, just normal, right? So you can imagine on a given uh, Sunday, many churches have to get bread for their communion ritual, right? Because many Christian uh, churches do communion, it maybe every Sunday or regularly. Well, where does that bread come from, right? Well, many churches have to buy the bread, right? They don't have their own bakery. They don't have a special facility just for their religious beliefs. They have to go buy the bread. So they have to go buy it at Panera. And through the process of buying the bread at Panera and moving it through hands of people and uh, getting up to the front of the altar, it goes from being profane to being sacred, right? And that is a social process. Those are social elements that can be observed by the sociologist. Regardless of whether something metaphysical is actually happening, that's not really what the sociologist is interested in. We are interested in the social ramifications of the given uh, religious ritual. Um, and that's a really good example of how we study religion, but we don't necessarily study in sociology who's right uh, given religion. We just study the social processes that are happening. Now, Durkheim's work suggests that one of religion's key functions in society is to create and reinforce collective bonds. So, um, again, that sense of community solidarity, the sense of what do we all believe, what do we have in common. Now, conflict theory, then, it is a little bit more, um, I suppose, nuanced, dynamic, um, regarding religion. Uh, another way to put it is some conflict theorists view religion one way and other conflict theorists view religion another way. So a conflict theorist can view religion as being the tool of the ruling elite to oppress the masses. This is the classic Marxian um, observation of uh, religion, that if people are willing to suffer in this life in exchange for non-tangible rewards, they're easier to exploit. So this is the type of critical, critical in a bad way, critical um, observation of religion that is kind of mean toward religion that was present in scientific and philosophical thought in the 1800s. You have to keep in mind to understand this, this, this perspective that a lot of the philosophical thought surrounding religion in Europe in the 1800s was in direct response to the French Revolution. The French Revolution was markedly anti-religion because the French aristocracy used religion to oppress people for hundreds of years. Thus, the mindset of the people in that area were that religion is used by the elite to oppress people. And it's a very good tool, quite frankly, for oppressing people. If you tell them, well, you have to listen to me or you won't go to heaven, well, then that, that it's true. That's a, that's a reality, right? That that is a way to make poor people do what you want them to do. And it's, it's a wicked thing to do. And so for a long time, um, social scientists were very critical of religion. But as social science progressed we began to take a less critical view of religion, a less nasty view of religion, if you will, and start to look at how religion can also be used to liberate people. And this concept of liberation theology, that religion can be used by the oppressed people to overthrow authority, um, really became obvious to people thinking scientifically about religion, observing what was happening in the world. In the mid-1900s, there were a, and it goes back farther than that in Latin America, there were series of 
religious uprisings that overthrew um, oppressive dictators, that overthrew um, the wicked uh, overlords of um, nasty regimes. And in Latin America, those were overwhelmingly Christian. And so scientists, social scientists had to figure out, well, what does this mean, right? We thought religion and Christianity was all about oppressing people. I guess we need to think about this differently. Um, that kind of use of power to overthrow religion, to overthrow authority is known as liberation theology. When you see it as capital L, capital T liberation theology uh, as a proper noun, that is regarding to a specific version of Catholicism um, that uh, is tied with the Jesuit order. Now, when you talk about lowercase l, lowercase t liberation theology, that can talk about any religion, be it Christian or otherwise, that is religion being used to over, override authority. So, for example, Martin Luther King was a liberation theologian, even though he was a uh, Baptist uh, pastor, Christian. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, was a Hindu, but he was also, in this sense, a liberation theologian. Now, to go back, Marx observed that religion serves the interest of the ruling class. Um, and I, I, I talked about this a little bit, but this is specifically what Marx observed. And that religion obscures exploitation as an outlet for misery. Like I said, that was the, the 1800s perspective uh, regarding religion and how it's used to oppress people. Max Weber then... Um, came later and observed that uh, Protestant beliefs, so specific Christian beliefs, regarding, um, regarding what makes a good person, right? So part of Protestant beliefs in the early 1900s, late 1800s, were all about hard work and uh, being enterprising and doing a good job. And that was tied into those kinds of religions at that time. And those kinds of commitment to hard work in that era led more religious people to tend to be better at business in certain ways. And that's about as much uh, detail as I can put into that. Uh, as, a, uh, as someone that studies religion uh, sociologically, I could talk about Weber and the Protestant ethic uh, for a very long, very boring time at you. I'm not going to do that. But it is a very interesting uh, concept, how you can see a one-to-one -one ratio between uh, certain types of religiosity and certain behaviors this way. But anyway, moving on. Symbolic interactionists, then. Symbolic interactionists view religion as being full of rich symbols that help people interact with each other and communicate complex ideas. Now, what you're seeing here are uh, clips from a, a fundamentalist Christian um, publication known as the Chick Tracks. The Chick Tracks are little comic books that are used by uh, Christians, certain Christians, as evangelizing tools. And what they do is they um, purvey s symbols, right, as all symbolic interactions are interested in. We see John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his own be only begotten son, etc., etc. And this is a symbol that is pretty universal to Christianity. And then we see in these same tracks images that certain modern Christians are not comfortable with because they don't really feel that it matches up with their modern faith. Uh, images of people burning in hell with the devil and the devil um, taunting people, right? That isn't, that's part of some Christian faith, but it's not universal to all Christian faith. And what is the interchange between these two types of Christian images? That was the kind of thing that when I was studying uh, the Chick Tracks, uh, I was very interested in. Uh, on my website, I have links um, to... Uh, presentations I've given uh, about the Chick Tracks. Um, you can look at those if you're interested. If not, 
eh, I don't really care. But you're welcome to. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, world religion profiles. So our five major world religions, as determined by number of adherents, are Christianity with 2 billion followers, Islam with 1.5 billion followers, Hinduism with 828 million followers, Buddhism with 400 million followers, and Judaism with 14 million followers. Now, it should be noted that Judaism is not the fifth largest world religion, but it is an incredibly influential world religion, due mostly because of its relationship with Christianity and Islam, right? So the fifth largest world religion is not Judaism. The fifth largest world religion, I believe, is either Taoism or Sikhism. But you can figure that out on your own relatively easily if you were really interested. Christianity. There are two billion followers of Christianity known as Christians. Uh, Christianity is the largest world religion. Uh, major teacher, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Jesus Christ, that guy, right? Central tenets of Christianity include that humans fell from God's grace through sin, right? That Christians... Most Christians believe that humanity has a certain tendency toward doing bad things, but God forgives them, and that Jesus was the divine Son of God. Uh, Christians believe in acceptance of God's teachings and Jesus' teachings, and forgiveness for, of sins via salvation. And those, sound, if you're not familiar, super familiar with Christianity, those sound like kind of specific beliefs. But there are so many different ways that Christians can believe these things. You might not know that not all Christians reject science. Um, that is a division uh, between types of Christianity. Some Christians are, there are Christians who are chemists and molecular biologists and psychologists, and sociologists, and all kinds of scientists. There are, that not all religion, churches oppose same-sex marriage. This is a division, not only between people and Christians, but between churches themselves. So, uh, Presbyterians have a very specific stance on same-sex marriage. Uh, Southern Baptists have specific stances. But also within churches, there's also conflict. Uh, so there are divisions uh, within uh, church entities in that regard. Islam, then, second largest world religion, fastest growing world religion. Uh, 1.5 billion followers of Islam known as Muslims. Uh, Muslim roughly translates to follower of the way. A major leader within Islam is the prophet Muhammad. There are other leaders within Islam, but uh, the Prophet was the primary one. Uh, there are cent five central tenets to Islam, known as the five pillars of Islam. First is belief in Allah. Allah roughly translates in the Arabic language to the God. Worship of Allah is the second tenet. Charitable giving. Uh, very similar to the Christian concepts of offering. Uh, fasting during the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, the holy month of Ramadan is one month in the uh, lunar calendar followed by Muslims, which can change its position during the year because uh, Western society, our society, we go on a solar calendar that is based on how where uh, the Earth is in regard to the Sun. The lunar calendar uh, is more based on the Moon, and that can shift a little bit. So sometimes Ramadan's in the summer, sometimes it's in the winter, or somewhere in between. And then the fifth pillar of Islam is that Muslims, if they possibly can, are expected to go to Mecca at least once in their life. Um, obviously, if you're very poor, living in the United States, that might not be a possibility for you. But if you're living, say, in Saudi Arabia, where Mecca is, that is expected more of you if you are a Muslim person. 
you might not know, non-Orthodox Muslim women are not required to wear hijab. It is seen as a choice to uh, Muslim women. The most common form of uh, Muslim headgear is the hijab, as we see here. Uh, it is a type of headscarf. There is no veil. Um, this is the type of covering we see most frequently in the Western world. Uh, other coverings, such as the burqa or the niqab, are um, more culturally specific, right? Uh, Islam does not, over, does not overwhelmingly require all women to dress in the same way, but, and many of these are tied in very closely with culture. Uh, and there are many Muslim women who are very devout believers that do not wear hijab, right? When women are uh, forced to wear hijab, it is typically because of the culture of the local area, right? So in Afghanistan, where uh, there are specific laws, or Saudi Arabia, when there are specific laws, they may claim it's part of the religion, but the religion itself does not require this type of dress. Similarly, uh, there are uh, rules and stipulations in the Quran regarding what men should wear as well. But the reason we don't notice this as often as uh, people that aren't part of that culture is because um, men's dress as it relates to uh, Islam more closely lines up with our traditional Western ideas of dress. Thus, it's not noticed as often. You might not know that the vast majority of Muslims reject violence, and the word jihad means religious struggle. It does not mean holy war. It means um, using your religion to make yourself better or make the world better. Now, the concept is often misused by both Muslim extremists, so people that misuse Islam for violence, but also people who are Islamophobic, right? People who are afraid of Muslims. Both of those groups misuse that word jihad to mean holy war. But the vast, vast majority of Muslims, their understanding of jihad is that it is overcoming something by using your faith. Thus, you can have a personal jihad to stop smoking. You can have a personal jihad to try to be more friendly to your neighbor right? It does not mean holy war. Hinduism. 828 million people in the world are Hindus, and most of us in the United States know very little about Hinduism. Major leaders of Hinduism, and this is very interesting, is there is no central leader or hierarchy. There is no central church to Hinduism. Hinduism is an incredibly non-hierarchical religion. Uh, there are local leaders, and uh, those people are sometimes called yogis, but uh, there is no central leadership. Central ten tenets of Hinduism are dedication to a deva, uh, or what we in our language often call a god. Now, that is not a perfect translation, uh, because uh, the Hindu gods are not quite the same as the Christian and Jewish and Islam God, but I'll talk about that in a second. Karma is a spiritual cause and effect that Hindus believe in. Karma, Hindus believe that you have spiritual energy attached to your soul. And the way that spiritual energy gets attached to your soul is through your dharma, or um, the behavior, the good or bad behavior that you do. So if you do good things, then you get good karma. If you do bad things, you get bad karma. And when you are, when you die, the net result of your good things or your bad things results in what happens to you in the next life. And 
what happens to you from the Hindu perspective is that for the vast majority of people, they are reborn into another life. Uh, and I'm trying, and I am being kind of vague here because uh, different Hindus have different ideas as far as what, um, how you get reincarnated, right? But the, the very short, very basic version of it is if you've lived a bad life, you're going to get reincarnated to a worse life. If you lead a good, holy, righteous life, you'll get reincarnated probably to a... Uh, better life but your ultimate goal is moksha if you live the best life then you will not be reincarnated that is the goal in hinduism is to not be reincarnated to become to rejoin godhead is the best translation to it uh, to stop being re reincarnated and to rejoin the divine which takes us into our next slide you may not know that Hindu devas or gods serve as representations of some aspect of the same supreme being. Uh, this is one interpretation of Hinduism. This is one of the more common interpretations of Hinduism. But many Hindus believe that all gods within their pantheon, all human beings all animals, all living things, everything with a spirit are pieces of the God with a capital G, right? And so the, this means a couple things to Hindus. So first of all, when we die then, if we live very good lives, we will stop being reincarnated and we'll become part of the God again, as we should be. Right. Um, so that's kind of their interpretation of what Westerners often call heaven. Um, but also each of the individual gods, Ganesh, Shiva, Kali, uh, Hunaman, all the others. Right. Those are pieces of one divine entity. So in that way, uh, you can have a loose interpretation of Hinduism and interpret it as being a monotheistic religion, actually, and not quite a polytheistic religion. Um, that is um, something most non-Hindus don't really know about Hinduism. And it's also something that some Hindus also have different interpretations of. But it should be said. Buddhism. 400 million people are Buddhists uh, worldwide. Uh, major teachers... Uh, of Buddhism are a man, the, the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama. Uh, he was a man that, if I remember correctly, lived somewhere around 400 AD. Uh, the Dalai Lama uh, was the 14th reincarnation of Gendandrup. Uh So let's go back in, to that a second. Uh, the Buddha was a Hindu priest uh, who lived... Uh, you know, a priestly life, and then he split off from Hinduism to form Buddhism, similarly to the way that Jesus was a uh, Jewish holy man and then split off from there. Uh, so you do see a kind of similar relationship between uh, Hinduism and Buddhism as you see within Judaism and Christianity. The Dalai Lama is said, the, so the leader of Tibetan Buddhists, is said to be the 14th reincarnation of a Lama known as Gendendrup. So that guy, the Dalai Lama, has lived 14 times. And he will, according to their beliefs in all likelihood, uh, be reborn again after, um, after he dies, right? Uh, that is the interpretation of their beliefs, because they do believe in reincarnation. Uh, Buddhism, Buddhists are non-theistic. So, uh, Buddhists do not believe in a grand creator God, uh, largely because that part of that is because they believe that the universe has always been here. Thus, if the universe has always been here, there was no creation. Thus, there was no creation God. Um, but there are some types of Buddhists that do believe in spiritual beings and gods. 
So it is not central to their belief that there is one central God, but certain types of Buddhists, uh, and so Tibetan Buddhists are included in there, do believe in beings that are more powerful than humans are and more knowledgeable in that regard. There are four noble truths to Buddhism. So these are seen as the four central beliefs to Buddhism. They believe we are caught in the endless suffering and rebirth as the result of karma. So uh, Buddhists believe, and suffering is kind of a not super accurate word here. Met, uh, I've heard, I was taught this uh, by a uh, professor uh, who, who spoke uh, fluent um, Hindi and other religions that more speci- other languages that speak more specifically to this. Uh, the word suffering isn't quite right. It should be messed upness, right? So a sense of not being right is the better interpretation other than suffering, right? So not being right um, in the world is something that Buddhists are very interested in. So this not being right is caused by karma. And suffering, not being right, results from our desire or attachment, right? So because we are attached to things, because we are attached to people, thus that causes our, our messed up in this. And suffering is ended. We can end that state of not being right by achieving nirvana, which is a blissful state of emptiness, a blissful state of not being attached to things and people. That is uh, an important part of being Buddhist. And Buddhists also believe in following the Eightfold Path. So ethical behavior, simple lifestyle, a renunciation of material pleasures, and meditation. These are the things that Buddhists uh, believe are important. You might not know, that the Buddha and other Buddhas uh, are not gods. They are seen as being great spiritual teachers. Um, there are Bo- Most Buddhas uh, in Buddhism are humans, but there are non-human Buddhas as well. And they are not entities that should be worshipped within Buddhism, but rather entities that can be learned from. And that is a big difference between Buddhism and belief systems like Christianity or Islam or Hinduism. Uh, Buddhists Buddhists can be atheists. Uh, They can also, as I mentioned, believe in certain gods. Uh, Those are not central to the belief system, though. Judaism. Uh, 14 million followers known as Jews, right? Most people in our society are aware of that. Major teachers within Judaism are Moses, King Solomon, and Abraham. Judaism is far less leader-oriented than Christianity or Islam is, right? There are central guys, right, to Christianity and Islam. Judaism is less leader-oriented than those two religions, but more leader-oriented than, say, Hinduism. Uh, Central tenets of Judaism include worship of and reverence for God. So that's the big important thing in Judaism is uh, worshiping and keeping God um, and respect for God. Uh, Community is also of central importance to Judaism. Community is so important to Judaism that actual there are many people that self-identify as being Jews, but also don't believe in God. And that is actually a testament to how central the idea of community and belonging in the community is to Jewish people, that there are some Jewish people that think that, that well, I don't believe in God, but I do believe in this community that we are a part of, and I still consider myself a Jew. You don't really see that in other religions. You don't, you don't see that in Christianity, for example, um, in the most part. I'm sure there are people, individuals, but it's, it's more of a social phenomenon within Judaism. With that said, the vast majority of people that consider themselves Jews do believe in God. Uh, I just had to make that clear. 
you might not know that belief in an afterlife is not central to Judaism. Um, that is, uh, it's, it's really just not emphasized, uh, the way it is within Islam and Christianity. Uh, Judaism, a lot of Judaism is about being good to people and being good to the community. Uh, and they don't pay us so much attention to what happens after we die. Um, most Jews, especially in the United States, well, most Jews do believe in an afterlife, but it's not of critical importance the way heaven is, for example, to Christianity. Uh, followers are seen as being God's chosen people. Uh, thus, they do not have the duty to convert others. Uh, as we sometimes see in certain versions of Christianity and Islam, uh, Christianity and Islam, uh, again, depending on the interpretation, can be very intent on making new Christians and new Muslims. Uh, Judaism does not have that. As a matter of fact, uh, given in most Jewish communities to become a Jew, you have to ask uh, a, a leader in the community, usually a rabbi, three times to become a Jew, and the rabbi is supposed to deny you that two times. Um, and but he doesn't, or she doesn't have to let you in, right? Uh, that's that's how not committed Judaism is to uh, converting people. Other world religions include. Uh, these aren't the only world religions, but these are just some of them, right? I said that before. Uh, indigenous animism, so people that believe in nature spirits. Baha'i, atheism. Atheism can be included as uh, a religion, uh, given many atheists don't believe it's a religion, but many atheists kind of do. Um, that is a matter of interpretation. Sikhism, Taoism, or Confucianism, Jainism. Spiritualism, so uh, the belief that uh, we can interpret, uh, interact with spirits of the dead. Uh, Neo-paganism, uh, a belief in recreating those religions in ancient Europe, right? Those pagan uh, polytheistic religions. Rastafari, Shinto, Unitarianism, a belief that all religions are valid. Uh, Zoroastrianism. Uh, the ever maligned Scientology. Scientology is a religion. Uh, smaller sects and cults. Uh, those ones on this slide that are starred, uh, I put stars next to them because I wanted to... These are uh, religions that have significant presences in the United States. Now, before we're done, let's talk a little bit about religion in the United States itself. The United States of America is a unusually religious nation. Compared to other countries, we have a, a lot more people that claim to be religious. 77% of adults in the United States say they are religious. That is a whole lot more than most other countries, uh, especially countries in what we consider the Western or developed world. It is dramatically lower in Europe, for example. 55% of people uh, pray daily, or they report to pray daily, and 20% of people share their faith, on onla faith online regularly, which is kind of a weird statistic, but it is, you know, it does say a certain amount uh, about how people in the United States are religion, religious. Uh, we are the most religiously diverse country in the world. Um, we are 71% Christian, 23% unaffiliated, which includes atheists, agnostics, and people who say they are religious, but not, not religious, but spiritual. That's, those are the people lumped into that category. Uh, 7% Buddhists, uh, 0.9% Muslim, so almost 1% Muslim, and 1.9% of our population is Jewish. Now, it should be noted that out the United States has uh, the second largest Jewish population in the world um, outside of uh, outside of Israel. So we do have a lot of Jews, but we also have a whole lot of other types of people as well. Uh, and the vast majority of people 
who are religious in the United States or report being religious uh, are that 71% Christian. Youth and young adults are less likely to claim religious affiliation than older adults, and data show that the unaffiliated are more likely than the affiliated affiliated to be critical of religion. So, and that kind of makes sense, right? If you say you're religious, you're less likely to uh, be critical of religion than the people who say they're not religious, right? That makes sense. Uh, religious organization. Oh. I'm sorry, the, it's like the, these last three bullets should be embedded in and they should be under uh, basic. These are what people who are unaffiliated with religion say. People who are unaffiliated with religion say that religious organizations are overly concerned with money and power. They say that they're too focused on rules and they say that religion is too closely involved with politics. That's what people who are critical of religion say. Uh, church membership has grown steadily in recent decades. And this is interesting, right? There are more people going to church now than before, uh, contrary to uh, what people may feel is happening. And the conservative strand of Protestantism is actually growing in membership and growing in influence. Uh, the United States um, is more strongly conservatively Christian than it used to be. Um, and th we see these movements really propped up in the early 1900s. Uh, and what it meant to be a good Christian in the like 1950s, met, it was different in probably a more conservative way than say the 1950, the 1850s, right? And uh, even just evangelism, sorry, mispronounced that there. Evangelism, is a belief in spiritual rebirth birth or being born again within your religion. And evangelism also has a certain uh, political influence on the Republican party. Uh, these are areas in which uh, Christianity has changed in the last 50 and 75 years that was not um, present before. Uh, religion being involved with politics is very much a, modern thing um, in the United States. And for many, uh, political beliefs are shaped by faith. As I mentioned, this is especially true for evangelicals, but it also applies to other groups, including non-Christians. Uh, um, in the United States, our, our religion and our faith um, are intertwined, right? Uh, and it there are any number of ways that this can be specifically um, I'm interested in uh, and I'm studying this with a couple colleagues in how there may have been an upsurge uh, in recent years in people who have become uh, practicing neo-pagans because of politics, right? That they see that following those faiths is an outlet for their political beliefs. Um, which is, you know, we don't know the nature of that relationship or if it's even there. That's why you do research projects, right? Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much it, or at least my summary of religion. Uh, this is a really very interesting topic, and I look to talking to you about it. Bye.